And if everybody else could turn to Matthew 6, that'd be great. I encourage you to bring your Bibles. Never trust te- preachers. <laughs> check preachers. It's too easy to make an emphasis on one thing and not emphasize something else. So check us out, please. I'm going to read to you from Matthew 6, um, verses 5 to 80. My subject today is uh, prayer. It's actually prayer and fasting. I meant to put fasting up there as well. So Matthew 6, starting at verse 5, reads like this. When you pray, you're not to be as the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners in order to be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray... Go into your inner room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will repay you. And when you're praying, do not use meaningless repetitions as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Just pop your ex anglicans there, okay? <laughs> For if you forgive men and transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transmi- transmissions, transgressions. Sorry. And whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance in order to be seen to be fasting by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you may not be seen to be fasting by men, but your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will repay you. And then in Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse 7, it says this, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it shall be opened. Or what man is there among you who when his son shall ask for him a loaf shall give him a stone? Or when he shall ask for a fish he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father who is in heaven give what is good to him who asks him? Therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, you do so so for them. For this is the law and the prophets." This is part of, as Lucas said last week, um, <clears throat> what Lucas described as the manifesto, the, the manifesto of the kingdom of God. It's a very important part of Jesus' teachings. And one of the ways you know this is that um, it's written in poetry. I don't know if you realize that. It, poetry is a great way. If, you, if you've got an oral tradition, if you don't want to write things down, poetry is the best way to remember it. And there's a form of poetry, and you can see it right the way through the, the, the Bible, and it's what's called parallelism. So you see it in the Old Testament. So it says, um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. It's gone. <laughs> he restores my soul. <laughs> it's called parallelism. So you make a statement, then you make a counter statement. And you make a statement, and you make a statement. Hebrew poetry, I mean, poetry doesn't translate well for a start. So you, it's, you take it out of its original language, it's difficult to see it. That's why you can't see it throughout the Bible. But you can see it. Hebrew poetry is unlike English poetry. English poetry has to do with rhythm. Okay, Mary had a little lamb, his fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was bound to go. Okay, there's rhythm. And we also tend to like rhyme in English poetry. The Hebrews weren't bothered about rhyme. There's rhythm, but there's not rhyme. The great thing is, you see, if you said, Mary had a little lamb, his fleece was white as snow, Try again. His feet were white as snow. His fleece was white as snow. <laughs> and everywhere that Mary went, he followed on his Harley. It doesn't scan. There's no rhythm. There's no rhyme. So you know it's wrong. It's like a checksum in code. Sorry, that's a programmer. It's a way of checking that the thing is right. And Jesus spoke this passage of, of, of his teachings in this form of poetry. So you can see it. 
Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Going back to the beginning, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So you can see this poetic form. It's brilliant. Jesus was a fantastic speaker. But the key thing, that this was common Hebrew, Hebrew text, Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrew method. Large parts of the Old Testament written in it. The other thing is that it's not, the Hebrew poetry was not just to do with the rhythm. It's also the subject matter. And so what happens, you create a subject and you put subordinate subjects off it. And this little passage is this, because the passage, and in, in Matthew 6 verse 1, it says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them, otherwise you have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. That is the main statement. Looking down it says, So when you give to the poor, don't do. So when you pray, you are not to. Whenever you fast, do not. The base statement is, Whatever you're doing, do it in the secrets of your heart. This whole passage is about what you do in the secret place of your heart, because that is where God sees. That's important. There tends to be a thought that loudness is godliness. <laughs> it's not. As Lucas um, spoke last week, uh, mentioned about the lady um, who had the hemorrhage. Let me read this to you. This is Mark 6. A woman who'd had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. It always amuses me that this is written in Mark and Luke. Luke was a doctor and he just avoids that little statement there. Um, <clears throat> and spent all that she had and was helped, but it had rather gone worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his clothes, cloak, for she thought... If I just touch his garment, I'll get well. Immediately the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power had proceeded from him, had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. I sat in the meeting last week. Lucas mentioned that early in the meeting. And I got to thinking about that, that woman. I was going to pray, but I didn't, didn't get to it. You know, <clears throat> if you look up on the web, people will tell you that that woman who had an issue of blood, we don't know any other detail about it, but by Levitical law, she was unclean. Okay? If she is unclean, anybody she touches becomes ritually unclean. So she's been there for, was it, 13 years, 12 years, whatever it said. She is by this stage an outcast. Socially and in religious terms, she's an outcast. She cannot touch anybody. So here is this poor lady coming to see Jesus. She must have been desperate. She cannot show her face. We're talking about first century Judea. People would know her. These days you can stand out in a crowd and nobody knows you. They would know her. If they recognized who she was, they would, they would have ousted her because they cannot be touched by her. She cannot show her face. She cannot go to Jesus and tell him because, first of all, she might have to show her face. But secondly, if anybody heard what she said, she would be thrown out of the crowd. And this is the thing that got to me about this lady. She said nothing. She didn't even speak to Jesus. But she had the faith to be healed. I love that. I love the fact that God saw in the silence of this hurting woman the crying of her heart. God sees in the secret. You know, when I was, um, when I was preparing this, I realized that of all the blessings of the Christian faith, there are many, many blessings. The, the most, the primary blessing, of course, is this. 
that we are not held responsible for our sins. That is the greatest blessing, that when we stand before the Lord, the price for our sins has been paid. But I would say the second greatest blessing, in my experience, of the Christian life is prayer. Prayer is the greatest joy that we have, that we can come into the presence of God. There's nothing quite like that. And I have to confess, one of the things, if you ever ask to preach, be prepared to get condemned. (laughs) I I go through terrible times where I say, how dare I preach this? (laughs) Wesley said, if you know it's truth, you've got to preach it. I can tell you the story of Thomas Bowler. Wesley knew he wasn't right, and he knew what right was, and he couldn't find the experience. And he said to this guy, Thomas Bowler, who was a Moravian, he said, how can I preach this? And he said, preach it until you know it. It's truth. That's the responsibility of the preacher, to preach truth. So when I've been preparing this, I know that I have to learn. I know that I'm talking to myself. Because prayer is the greatest. And the reason I realize this is I know that I don't pray enough. Okay? I'm not talking ought. Okay? There's a lot of oughts. There's a lot of you ought to be doing this and all. I know that I'm missing out. I know that the greatest joy in my life is when I sit down with the Lord and I open my heart and I wait on God. Why don't I do it more? Because I've got a job and I've got a business and I've got family. Matthew 6 1 says, Beware of practicing wretchedness. I've already talked about that, haven't I? Um, <clears throat> so, this whole section, this first section here, is to do with speaking to God that God hears you in the secret place. Matthew 6 6 says, When you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who sees in secret. You know, if you look at Christian biographies, you will very often find biographies of preachers. You'll find biographies of evangelists. You'll find biographies of of missionaries. Quite often, autobiographies. But I tell you what you won't find very often is biographies of, let's call them prayer warriors or intercessors. There are one or two. Reese Howell. If you ever want to read a book about someone who prayed, read the book called Reese Howell, Intercessor. It wasn't written by him. It was written by somebody else. Prayer is a secret thing. I was, um, I was uh, reading the other day about the Hebridean Revival. This happened in 1948. And if you look in, the, in Wikipedia about the Hebridean Revival, and, and basically up in the Hebrides, the Lord suddenly broke out. They were in a meeting, and suddenly this, this people started crying out to God. And there was a revival among the, the Hebrides. It's fantastic to read. If you look at it in the, on the internet, you'll find that the name that comes up is Duncan Campbell. And he was the main preacher. I said Duncan, not Donald, and Donald is the speed, the, 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 yeah, 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 Duncan Campbell. But I'll tell you, if you read the story, that wasn't the reason the revival happened. There were two little old ladies who set themselves to pray. And it's interesting, if you look at revival, and Reese Howe is another example, Reese Howe was involved in the Welsh revival in 1904. If you look at revival, there is normally a figurehead, but somewhere behind the scenes is a prayer. A prayer warrior or more, two or three normally. And what you'll find is, these people you don't hear about. Because praying is secret. There's no prayer ministry. I, 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 I know there's, there's reason for calling it this, but I shy away from the term prayer ministry because there is no such thing in the Bible as a gift of prayer. Okay? It's open for everybody. Everybody can pray. Now, certainly the Lord may take certain people aside and say, I want you to pray. There's no, you know, because if you say, I've got a prayer ministry, it says, oh, I haven't got a prayer ministry. Somebody else hasn't got a prayer ministry. Somebody else hasn't got an evangelism ministry. Evangelism is for everybody. Prayer is for everybody. Yes, there's an evangelist gift. There isn't a gift of prayer. Okay? Praying is something, praying is the most needed operation, the most needed function in the church, but is the one with the least publicity. But behind every single, um, every single revival, there are people praying. I read a while ago about a, a revival that broke out in Bradford. And the first thing that happened, the Lord started moving and the church prayed 
and they prayed night and they prayed day. And they didn't pray nice little comfortable prayers. <laughs> I, I was, when I first was converted, I was converted into a Baptist church in my mid-teens. And I came up to Warrington um, through some process a while later, and I came into a church where it was on the tail end of revival, but I went into a prayer meeting, and I was used to prayer meetings where someone would say a nice little neat prayer, and then somebody else would say a nice little neat prayer, and it was all very nice. And in this prayer meeting, they all prayed together. And they stood up, and they shouted, and they cried, and if someone said something, you go, yeah, Lord, it was like Des, you know. <laughs> it was so noisy, and so much happened. Okay, I'm losing my track here. Um, Matthew 6, 9, Jesus says, don't use vain repetitions. You know, I was born into a nominal Anglican family, and in one, my dad was in the army, and he was stationed in a, a little village in Shropshire, and I was sent to the local school, and the local school was next to a local church, so on a Sunday morning, he decided I needed to go to Sunday school. They didn't go. <laughs> and the priest, the, the vicar, taught me that when you come into to church, you've got to kneel down and say the Lord's Prayer. I could rattle off the Lord's Prayer in about 10 seconds flat, less, <laughs> at high speed. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. He gives the Lord's Prayer, and he, immediately before he says, don't use vain repetitions. It's not a case of trotting out the prayer. There's nothing wrong with praying the Lord's Prayer, but it's a pattern. So let's look at the pattern. Um, <clears throat> can you hold it on a bit? Oh, and the next one, sorry, forgot about that one. Uh, okay, leave it there. <laughs> First of all, it says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The word hallowed is simply another translation of the word holy. Okay, I don't know why they translate to hallow. It is just the word holy. Holy, we use this word holy very glibly in our, in our, in our usage. But holy to the Jew was something very, very different. Here is a picture of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a tent that the Jews would establish as they traveled for 40 years. The Hebrews, sorry, not the Jews, the Hebrews. The Jews were just one tribe of the Hebrews. The Hebrews, as they traveled in the wilderness, they would erect this tent, and there was a strict order in which the, the whole encampment of the Hebrews was set out, Oh, as you can see there, all the various tribes, Ephraim, I'm quite sure they didn't in reality have flags above their tribe, but uh, <laughs> that's how it is. But right in the center was this tent that was known as the tabernacle. Tabernacle simply means a tent. So there was the outer court of the tabernacle, and uh, Eric is probably weeping, oh, he's not here, because I'm not going into the symbolism. If you want to really get into the symbolism of this, talk to Eric or talk to Tom. They know the symbolism. It's fantastic. The, the, in so many places, the Old Testament is a picture of Jesus and a picture of what God's, God's purpose in salvation. But anyway, there was the outer court, and then inside the outer court, there was a huge, great big altar where the, the sacrifice for sin, Jesus is our sacrifice for sin, of course. Then there was a laver, a big bowl with water in. And then there was this tent, and uh, <clears throat> the tent, inside the tent... Everything was gold, okay? It was beaten gold. It was uh, laid on top of wood. Everything you could see was gold. The tent was covered with six layers of covering, which basically means that inside the tent, it would have been pitch black, except for the fact that there was a candlestick. You would have heard nothing from outside, and it would probably have been steaming hot as well, I should imagine. But inside the tent, there were two chambers, one was called the holy place, and the second was called the holy of holies. Now, the holy of holies, where was the Ark of the Covenant, was considered to be the place where God lived. The word holy basically means separate, utterly different. To the Jews, to the Hebrews, it was fearful. It was a fearful place. There's a reason why I want that picture up. I'll come back to it. But first of all, our Father which art in heaven, holy is your name. Separate, different, utterly different, fearful. I'm very wary of this Jesus is my best buddy approach. When we come to God, it's important to remember 
But this, this God who condescends to allow us to be f- his friend, absolutely right he does. Never ceases to be the one who made heaven and earth. Never ceases to be the one that we will stand before in judgment. Hallowed be thy name. If we're going to pray, we have to start with a correct understanding of who and what God is. The reason I want that picture up there, I believe that in the heart of every spirit-filled Christian, there's a holy of holies, a place that is only God. As Christians, we have to learn, we have to find the way into that place in whatever circumstance we're in. The tabernacle is a picture of our relationship with God. Let's move on. Matthew 6.10 says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom come obviously has to do with evangelism. All right? But not just that. The kingdom of God is the kingdom where God's will is worked out. And firstly, that's in here. If we don't come to pray with a desire to be and do as God wants, then God will not hear our prayers. Absolutely fundamental. If we cannot say, Lord, in my life, let not my will be done, but thy will be done, that was Jesus' prayer, then we will never pray properly. Matthew 6, 11 says, Give us this day our daily bread. Can I encourage you, pray for today. Okay? What I mean by that is, it's very easy to have generalized prayer. This is what I do. First of all, and and please understand this, prayer is a very personal thing. It's It's your own relationship with God. So I can't tell you, I can't tell you, do my thing. My relationship with God is my relationship with God. Yours might be different, but there are certain principles that are true. First of all, For me, find a place, you have to find a place and a time when you can find the holy holy, holies in your heart. For me, it's the morning, okay? The morning is when my mind is thinking properly. If I try and pray in the evening, my mind is full of work, my mind is full of all kinds of other things. For me, the morning is the best. But then I don't have young kids around the house. (laughs) Okay? It may not work that way. Find a place. I've, I've just moved house and I've got a study. Um, I've got my own business, so I need a place to work. I've got this little place. Sue can't shout at me from there. I can't hear her. (laughs) So it's so quiet. (laughs) It's great. Find a place and find a time. And then sit down with the Lord. And I would encourage the morning. The fact that Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread will suggest he's talking about the morning because if you're praying for this day, it's the day ahead. Okay? Pray for the things that you want to pray for for today. So for me, I know two little girls who are seriously ill. So I pray that the Lord would grant to Amy the grace to overcome today. If she's in comfort because of the treatment, I want the Lord to bless her today, to give her comfort today. I pray for my work. I worry. I'm by nature someone who worries a lot. Okay, I, you'd be amazed at what I worry about. I'm, 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 a, I'm a nervous person. If I'm going to a new customer and going to visit somebody I've not seen before, I'm worried. You people think if you stand up here and preach, you must be ever so confident. Forget it. I'm not. I can do this. <laughs> Visiting new people, new customers, I find quite, find quite squarely. So labor down before the Lord the things that you're doing today. There's nothing wrong with bringing your work into your prayer life. In fact, it's the best thing to do because that makes the Lord into the whole of your life. So I sit down and I say, what have I got to do today? Lord, give me the grace for that. The things that scare me. Pray for Lucas. Sorry, Lucas. The, uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm fairly certain that Lucas is a human being, not a robot. I think if he was a robot, somebody would have given him a better accent chip. But, uh, <laughs> the fact that he's a human being, I assume, means that he probably has bad days. Okay? There are probably days when Lucas and Sarah might not agree I to I'm quite sure there never is. <laughs> Lucas might come to church, he might be seething, he might be upset, and we talk to him. He is not allowed to show that. Do you know that? He's not allowed to show that. So when we come and we put our problems on Lucas, 
He's got to set aside whatever he's thinking, and Sarah, sorry, Sarah. I'm sure Sarah is utterly submissive and never actually argues with Stuart. <laughs> now, it's right that he does that because there is a gift of pastorship and God will give him the grace. But we need to pray for Lucas that God gives him the grace to set aside that he, when he has a day like we all do, he can't say, push off, I'm not feeling great today, can he? It's hard. You've got to be constant. Otherwise, people will start pointing the finger. Another thing is, the AOG way puts a lot of pressure on one man. Okay? Which means, and we have to bear in mind, there is a devil. The devil knows that the best way to damage lots of people in life church is to get at this man. Think about that pressure. Oof. Could be health, could be sin, could be being led in a wrong direction. Pray for Lucas. When I pray for Lucas, I pray mostly for the gift of discernment. The ability in God to know the difference between what seems right and what is right. Pray for Lucas today. What I sometimes do, like I said, I'm a warrior. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll sit down with the Lord, I'll get a book, and I'll write down what I call a worry list. Just the things that are bugging me. You know, some work, I, I'm worried now about a job I've got to do in a few weeks' time, which is a really difficult job at Jaguar in Halewood. And it's, it's a nothing, really. But like I say, I just worry about everything. Write them down, and one by one, give them to the Lord. Develop your own way of doing things. But relax in the presence of God. Get yourself to a point. One of the things about that, there's a, there's a big altar there. That's the altar for the sacrifice for sin. Jesus is our sacrifice, but it's also the altar for worship. Worship is not what we do in this church. Worship is bowing down. Okay, I've said this one before. We praise. We do worship as well. Don't get me wrong. Sorry. <laughs> but the next thing is called the laver. And the laver was a big bowl of water where you washed off the dust from your feet and from your hands. Do that. Lord, I'm worried about this. I'm worried about that. I'm worried about the other. Set it all aside when you're going to be with the Lord. Matthew 6, 12 says, Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And again in Matthew 4, 6, 14, If you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive you for your transgressions. That word transgressions, it's in, the, in the first verse there, it actually means debts, but it's obviously not meaning debts. But I love the way the old translations translated. They said transgressions, or tra trespasses is the word they used. Trespass is when you tread on something that somebody else is. And I was thinking about this the other day. It's, it's a lot to, we, we think in terms of people who, you know, they, uh, they, they uh, persecute you or do terrible things to you. But in truth, who trespasses on your feelings the most? I'll tell you who. The people who are closest to you. Uh, some, some couple of years back, my family clubbed together and we bought Sue a... Uh, she's going to kill me because she hates it when I talk about her. We bought her a, um, an iPad, okay? She was a bit of a technophobe. We didn't know it would work, but she actually took this iPad. But Sue zones things out. When she's on this iPad, she zones out everything else. And it's quite common. She can be sat watching this Pinterest thing. Is Pinterest that... She'll look at it, and she's got pictures of people's meals. I don't, I don't understand those things. And, and I'll talk to her, and she doesn't even hear me. You know, I say, Sue, what about this? Wait, you know, it's nothing. She's sat there, there's absolutely nothing. <laughs> now, I could get offended at that. I could say, how dare she ignore me? I'm her husband. And when I was just married, I probably would have got offended. And what I'd have done is I'd have then said, you know, you're not listening to me. And she'd have got offended. And, you know, because I'd have trampled on her feelings in some way or other. I never understand these things. I mean, and in fact, probably on, someone will tell her that I've been talking about it today. So I'll get a slight rebuke on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive each other. The thing is, we all have offended God. The reason I talk about the people closest to you, is offense builds up. So I become offended, I offend Sue, she's offended. 
I'm offended because she's offended. And so it goes on. In your marriage, forgive those that offend you. There's a right time to apologize. Sometimes you get the wrong time and it doesn't work. <laughs> There's a right time I've learned to say I'm sorry. It's in your heart. Forgive. Don't let offense build up. Matthew 6.13 Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I'm going to go through this fast. Basically, that has to do with leading. The fact that Jesus talks and says, we've got to seek God for leading in our lives, there is an attitude that says, oh, God won't let this happen. We have a responsibility to listen to God, to do the right thing that God wants us to do. We have to be praying. This is why we pray again for Lucas, that we have to know the way that God wants us to do. That's part of prayer. So part of prayer is saying, Lord, what do you want me to do about this situation? What do you want me to do about that situation? It's important to do that. Very quickly, because I'm way out of time, the next section is about fasting. Fasting, Sue and I disagree over this one. <laughs> I don't believe, there is an approach that says fasting shows God that you're serious about things. If you take that route, you're going to say, okay, if I walk around in barefoot on thorns, then the Lord is going to see I'm serious about things. I don't, I'm not into that sort of thing. I'll tell you what fasting is really, really good for, though. Fasting clears the mind, because when you eat, your body is using oxygen, and the oxygen isn't going to your brain. That's why you go to sleep after Sunday lunch. If you stop eating for a couple of days, your brain will be so clear. That's why Jesus said, this kind not com comes not out but by prayer and fasting. Fasting is almost always associated with prayer. Fast to give you a clear mind to pray. Just <clears throat> flip the next side on if you could. The second section was ask and you will receive. Those are some of the verses, just some of them, where Jesus says, if you ask, I'll give it to you. Now as Christians... We read, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all things that you ask in prayer is even you will believe. We all say, oh yeah, amen Lord. But if you're a skeptic like me, to be absolutely honest with you, I'm saying, yeah, yeah, I know, I've heard it. Do we really believe that? I was reading about the, there's a time in Mark 10 when Jesus sent 70 of his disciples and they had been wandering around with him seeing him heal the sick and cure people and raise the dead and all things. And he said, right, off you go. You go and heal the sick. You go and preach. You go and raise the dead. And they went off, read it in, Matthew, in Mark 10, and they come back and says, wow! This, this holy, the spirits, are, they, they're subject to us. People are being raised. People are being healed. Now the thing about faith, faith is based on two things. The Bible says faith comes through love. These 70 disciples, they had seen Jesus, they'd been walking with Jesus, and Jesus said, you're going to be able to do that thing. Because they loved Jesus, they had the faith to go out. But there's something else. Evidence. They'd seen it happening. Faith is based on love, but it needs evidence. Some years back, a friend of mine, his daughter got leukemia. As a church... We prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed. She is now a nurse at Clatter Bridge Hospital. She was the only one that survived in their ward. A few months back, or a couple of years back, I think it was, Crispian was seriously ill. And we prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed. And she got well. Now, statistically, that could be coincidence. As a church we need to prove statistics wrong. We need to start being specific about prayer. I was going to read another passage, the, the, the equivalent passage in Mark's Gospel, and explains why Jesus talks about knocking. Jesus talks about a man who's, who's a visitor comes to him late at night, and he goes to his neighbor and he bangs on the door and says, I've got a visitor who's come, give me some food. And the neighbor says, no, I've gone to bed, I'm not giving you anything. 
And in this story, the na- this, this man keeps knocking, and this is Jesus' parable, he keeps knocking, and eventually the guy gets up and he says, okay, you can have bread because you, I'm fed up with you. And Jesus is saying, that is how to pray. Not that God is going to get fed up with it. it the, the principle is persistent. And I would say this as a church, as a challenge. We need to start persistently praying to see the un, the, that which can only be God. That's what we want. Effort is a great thing. We have bags of enthusiasm in this church. And you can do quite a lot of enthusiasm. We need to see miracle. We need to see the evidence. It's not a dirty word. Some Christians think that's a dirty word. Yes, faith is based on love. But when you see something happen, you say, oh, amen. And you do it again. And you do it again. And you pray again. And this happens. And that happens. And soon we are a church in revival. But we need to take the challenge. As a church, we need to say, we are going to pray until. Then people will come in. Because people are going to come in here with problems that cannot be resolved by us sitting and talking to them and loving with them and bringing them in. And if we do not have an answer for them, we may as well just be another social service. We've got to go to that which only God can give. That's a challenge to us. Amen. I belted through it. but. Uh...